I'm going to talk about the number one vitamin D danger that you must know about. There are so many different lies about vitamin D that you're told on a regular basis. I'm going to sort all that out. On one hand, they'll tell you, keep your vitamin D not over 4,000 IUs to keep everything safe. But on the other hand, if you need a therapeutic dosage to correct a major illness, you're going to have to use amounts much, much higher than that. But the problem with that is the medical institutions will tell you those levels are toxic. They're dangerous. Vitamin D is the most important vitamin. Why? Because it's involved with 2,500 different genes. No other nutrient that is in our food is involved with even close to that many different things. The other thing to know is there's no agreed upon blood level of vitamin D. It's all over the place. Some doctors say that you'll be fine with 20 to 30 nanograms per milliliter. Yet other doctors will say you can go up to 150 nanograms per milliliter. The interesting thing about the blood level of vitamin D is that it's not very well correlated with the vitamin D inside your cells. Most medical journals do not like to publish anything positive about vitamin D. Why? It competes with big pharma because you can get vitamin D for free from the sun. So don't expect a lot of vitamin D research in the future, especially using higher amounts. Their goal is to make vitamin D very, very dangerous and toxic at low amounts. It's also virtually impossible to get your vitamin D levels from your food. It's just, it's not in our diet. So to start this presentation, let's give you a little foundation on my whiteboard. Check this out. Looks complex, it's really simple. Up here you have the vitamin D starting source, okay? You have the sun, food, or supplements, okay? And most doctors know the pathway to turn this type of vitamin D through the liver, through the kidney, into the cell to control bone, okay? The skeletal system. But what most doctors don't know is there's two different systems for vitamin D. One system is all about calcium and bone, and that is all the non-calcium functions of vitamin D, especially the immune system, the prostate, other glands, the skin, the gut, the brain, the muscles. This other system of vitamin D that controls all this other stuff is separate from this system right here. In other words, it doesn't have to go through the liver and the kidney and all that. And just to make this really simple, let's pretend this is vitamin D coming into the body, it goes to the liver, it attaches to a protein. Now, why would it attach to a protein? So it can actually stay in the blood for a longer period of time because the half-life of this right here is 24 hours. So to increase the half-life to three to four weeks, you need to connect it to a protein, okay? So it can be stored in the blood. And then when you need it, it goes through the kidney and it detaches. So this vitamin D can go into the cell and eventually into the bone. But with this other system right here, what you need to know is that the blood vitamin D that's attached to that protein is not gonna be going into the system. Only a tiny bit of the vitamin D in your blood is gonna go into this system if you have damage to the liver, if you're pregnant, if you're on birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, if you have cancer or viruses. The more that this protein is stuck really hard to that vitamin D, and it takes a lot more of it to release. And this is why you only get just tiny amounts from the blood into all these other sources. So then the big question is, where is the vitamin D coming from? It's coming from either vitamin D in your food or the supplements or the sun. Most of the research done in vitamin D is done on this system. And so everything it revolves around these low numbers, 600 to 800 IUs, as well as the blood levels of vitamin D being between 25 and 30 nanograms per milliliter. That might be sufficient for the bones, but not for this system right here. Now, on top of everything, you have other things that can block the sun and other supplements, air pollution, sunscreens. And it's interesting how a lot of health problems started to increase right after that very stupid recommendation. The more gut inflammation you have, the less you're gonna be able to absorb vitamin D. If you have a magnesium deficiency, which most people do, you're not gonna get this right through in here. And the majority of people have some type of genetic problem that prevents them from absorbing vitamin D. Also, depending on your latitude, 
how close do you live to the equator versus living further up in Northern America where you're gonna get less sun. Also, your altitude matters. If you live in Colorado, you'll get more vitamin D because you're very high altitudes in the mountains versus somewhere at sea level, you're gonna get less vitamin D. Also, depending on the season, in the winter, you don't get virtually any vitamin D from the sun. Obesity can also disperse your vitamin D. The older you are, the less vitamin D you're gonna absorb. If you have insulin resistance, that's a pre-diabetic situation. If you don't have enough cholesterol, let's say for example, you're on a statin drug which blocks cholesterol. Did you know that you need cholesterol to make vitamin D3? Also, if you don't have a gallbladder, you need the bile to help you extract this fat soluble nutrient, vitamin D3. So if someone is fairly healthy and they don't have any of these problems, they would need between 6,000 and 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 to maintain this system right here, just to maintain it. All right, now let's go back to where I left off from. So now you know there's two different systems of vitamin D, one for the bone, one for everything else. The other really important point I wanna emphasize is when you take vitamin D, it should be daily, okay, not weekly, because the lion's share of vitamin D that feeds this other non-calcium system comes from the diet, sun, or supplements that you would have to get exposed to from the sun or take supplements every single day. And the more problems you have, the more vitamin D you need to take to create this therapeutic dosage. One really important thing to know is that a therapeutic dosage, which is higher amounts, does not mean it's a toxic dosage. There's some fascinating information by an ophthalmologist out of Germany who wrote a book on high doses of vitamin D and glaucoma. He has found amazing results by giving his patients high doses of vitamin D3 and getting results with glaucoma and many other different eye abnormalities. He said to create a therapeutic range, you have to get the blood levels between 60 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. And what you're going to get is a remodeling of the eye. You have to realize that your immune system already has the ability to kill cancer and viruses, if it has enough vitamin D. These viruses and cancer even create an environment where vitamin D doesn't work too well. They can even make that protein that's involved with binding to vitamin D extremely tight. So how do we counter this? Well, the only way is to increase your vitamin D3, especially for autoimmune issues, for cancer, for infections. But on the flip side, you've been told that vitamin D is toxic in certain amounts. Vitamin D3 toxicity is extremely rare, and you would have to take hundreds of milligrams of vitamin D3 for months to create this hypercalcemia. Personally, from looking at this information, I think that the real problem from toxicity of vitamin D3 comes when you don't take the cofactors. Vitamin K2 and zinc also indirectly affects calcium. I mean, if you think about it, magnesium also greatly reduces the chance of getting kidney stones, which usually comes with hypercalcemia. What you'd have to do is you'd have to drink more water to keep it diluted and keep it from being saturated. Also, magnesium greatly decreases the saturation of calcium stones. And if someone's gonna take a maintenance dosage of 10,000 IUs, that would be equivalent to being out in the sun for 20 minutes. 20,000 is being out in the sun for 40 minutes. Another interesting point that Bruce Hollis talked about is called the vital study. This was a bogus study that cost the taxpayers $30 million. And this research, based on what Bruce Hollis told me, was done to invalidate vitamin D, not support it. It's obvious that Big Pharma was probably involved with this study indirectly because the odds of the medical industry doing more research in vitamin D are greatly diminished after that study. So with this knowledge, I think that you don't have to worry about the toxicity effects. And if you haven't seen this video on vitamin D, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Check it out.